Um, so welcome back everybody to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective grow growing by the moment. Yay. Um, and uh, tonight we're going to talk about the Dharma, of course. Um, in particular, what we're going to talk about tonight, the theme for tonight's uh, session is going to be this uh, idea of punya, usually translated as merit. As usual, we'll talk about the translation of these terms, but I'm probably actually probably be using the word punya a lot tonight, uh, just because it's kind of its own, it's kind of its own idea. Um, in many ways, we've actually already talked about it several times. Um, I was actually just going back through. So everybody here, everybody who's here right now knows that we've been looking at this uh, Mahayana Buddhist Sutra. We've been looking at this Manjushri Pure Land Sutra. And we're actually, um, I was looking back at the record <laughs> And we've been looking at this all year. So since January, basically right after New Year's, we started this sutra. And so this has been an epic Dharma doors of uh, an almost, an, we, it basically will be a year by the time we're done with this, which is amazing. But then, as you know, what we've been doing is I've been designating each Dharma doors each Sunday night to a particular topic. And all of the topics have been coming from the sutra, and I've chosen every topic because it pertains to the bodhisattva path. It, it pertains to this idea of the bodhisattva practice. Now, had I gone into this no, knowing we were going to take this long, I, I might have planned this a little bit differently. So, for example, a number of weeks ago, I did a a, a Dharma doors, and the theme was uh, something called Parinamana, the uh, normally translated as uh, transference, in particular the transference of merit. And so we did that whole class on the transference of merit. And now tonight we're going to talk about what merit is. I probably should have done the class on merit. And then we would have learned how to transfer the merit. But my point is, is that tonight will relate a lot to that class. But actually, as I was preparing notes for tonight, as I was kind of just jot jotting down some ideas, you know, it really made me realize how all of, all of these classes this year have really been interestingly interconnected in, in a way. Like, it's not a very good linear treatment of the bodhisattva path, but it really is a great collage, I think, of all these different aspects of, you know, what makes Mahayana Buddhism Mahayana Buddhism, what makes the bodhisattva path the bodhisattva path. So tonight, we're going to look at this idea of punya that's actually really important to a lot of things we've already talked about. I guess that's what I want to say. But let's go ahead and dive in. Let me kind of give you a lay of the land. So this idea of punya, I, I actually think this is really interesting. When I first thought of making this the topic, I was thinking, oh, but you know, you people might think this is boring. Merit, it's like, and I know that it kind of maybe can seem or sound a little boring in that way, but it's actually very interesting if you think about it. And that's where I want to pull way, way back and just talk about this idea of merit. Again, merit is the way that punya, tonight's topic, merit is usually the way that it's translated. And in many ways, I, I can't really think of many, a better translation Another one, a different translation, which actually is the translation that's in the from our Tibetan version, you could translate it as a, a boon, B-O-O-N, but a boon, I mean, I don't know, that's not the first word in my vocabulary. It's sort of, I feel like an outdated or, you know, it's definitely a 20th century word. 
So boon isn't very helpful. I could think of translating it as a benefit. And in fact, I'm going to lean a little bit tonight and thinking about it as a benefit. But let's kind of, again, let's go back. When, when we think of this idea of merit, so I don't know about you, but the very, very first thing that comes to my mind is the idea of a merit badge. And a merit badge is something that's uh, usually kind of related to like Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts, Girl Scouts. And it's this idea of that you've been working on a skill or a trade or some sort of technique. And when you do enough of it or you master it, you get a little badge that they sew on to your uniform. And it's a, it's a sign that you've accomplished uh, a, a certain skill. And then you get more and more of these merit badges until you're loaded up with all kinds of, of merit in that way. So that's what I think of when I think of, a, of merit. And in many ways, that's what we're talking about, actually. In an interesting way, we are kind of talking about that. And, and what I mean is, there's sort of yet another way of thinking about these merit badges or just sort of just merit, not merit badges, but just merit. And it's sort of about ideas of like, you could almost kind of think of it as tokenizing practice. So you, you're doing this thing and then as a sign of accomplishment or a sign of of, of progress, you might have a token, you know, and I know that they use this like in the AA, uh, in the uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, you, they use the, the, the coins for different stages of sobriety. That's a merit badge of sort, where you get to a certain point and you have a token that says you've made it that far. And again, these are all over the place. And so what we're really getting at is a sort of like, and th this is why I could possibly consider translating punya as a benefit. But it's this idea of like, well, like you're doing something and there's something that you're going to get in return for it in a way. And the idea is, is that if you look at if you even just look at money and the idea of doing something and then getting this money in return for it, that's that's kind of a form of punya as well. So sort of in a way. My point is, is that there is this way of being in the world. It doesn't have anything to do with religion. It doesn't have anything necessarily to do with the Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts. But it's a way of being, doing, and thinking, which is that there, there's a, a, a payoff, a benefit to this. So, for example, another way of thinking about this would be like going to the gym and like working out every day. The idea is, is that you might be doing that for a reason. Maybe it's health, maybe it's muscles, maybe it's physique, whatever it is. But if somebody asked you like, whoa, you, every morning, every morning I see you, you get up and you go to the gym for an hour and come back. Like, you know, what are you doing? And the idea is, is that you would be doing it for some reason that there's like a, a payoff in that way. And so tonight, what we're kind of looking at, at is not going to the gym, not the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, but we're looking at the idea that doing a religious or a spiritual practice has, has a, a result, has a, a, a boon to it, a benefit to it. So that's sort of the lay of the land tonight where I want to be looking at this idea of what would be called spiritual rewards. Now, 
we often talk about punya, we often talk about this idea of spiritual rewards, or I wind up talking about this a lot, because it's such an important part of Indian religious traditions, of which Buddhism is one. So I want to make clear right now that what you know, we're about to get into is not exclusively a Buddhist idea. We're going to talk about what the uniqueness of Buddhism in this, but the idea is, is that it's a very well-established part of the Indian cosmological, religio-spiritual worldview. It's a part of that worldview that there is something called punya. And punya is a kind of a metaphysical reward system, for lack of a better phraseology in that sense. And what it is, is it's the idea that, in particular, it's the idea that moral behavior has a metaphysical benefit to it. So in Buddhism, when we think of moral behavior, right, we're usually very, very focused on killing, stealing, lying, bodily or sexual misconduct, and intoxicating the mind. Those are sort of the five big ones, right? Those are the five precepts. And so within the Buddhist, the early Buddhist tradition in India, the idea was, was that, say, to be honest, to be truthful, one received punya for such behavior. Whereas to be deceitful, to be to lie, causes a kind of demerit, a kind of a punya, a, no, a lack of punya in that sense. And so the idea is, is that the reason why one would be moral is to accrue or generate punya. And the reason why you would avoid being immoral is because you wouldn't want to lose any of your punya. Now, the idea is, is that, and th this is very complicated, of course, and different re religious traditions of India are going to split off in terms of how they exactly think of this. But the idea is, is that you, you do these practices, you're, so you're upright, you're moral, you're nonviolent, you're, you're, you do these things, or you don't do certain things, and you accrue this punya. And as you accrue this punya, well, there's a number of different things that could come from that traditionally. So not in a Buddhist context, but just in a normal religious context of India, Health might be affected by punya, actually. The idea is that if you start to get ill a lot, it could be indicative of a low punya count in that sense, bad morality in that way. Um, other kind of things, um, just sort of overall trajectory of life going downhill in that way, sometimes is attributed to punya. But then what we're really interested in if we're thinking about India, Indian religious traditions, then what we're really thinking about is reincarnation. And we're really thinking about the idea of when we die, we're going to get reborn. And the generally understood cosmology is, is that where and how you are reborn is dictated by your accrual of punya. So now the idea in general is you really want to be generating that punya because not only does generating punya lead to better health, no, not only does punya lead to, oh, you know, better job, more wealth, all of those things, but the idea is, is that generating punya leads to ultimately a better rebirth, a better station in life, uh, meaning more powerful, even bigger house, even more wealth. And if you're really 
really full of punya, you could actually be reborn in a heavenly realm. But that would, that would take quite a bit of punya to, to do that. But that is sort of the payoff or that's the reward for moral behavior in that sense. So now let's back up a little bit because I don't want to make this all sound, I don't want this to sound superstitious at all. The idea here is, is that, you know, what we're talking about has a lot to do with karma, but let's remember karma just means action, action of the body, action of speaking, action of thinking. So the things that we're doing are producing effects. And the idea is, is so basically what I'm getting at is, is that through our constant production of activity, we are either generating or losing punya all the time. Truly, like with every single thought, if that thought is angry and bitter, whatever, then that's going to lead sort of to the demerit. And if, if, if it's a mind of loving kindness and compassion, that's going to be punya. That's going to increase your merit. So what I'm getting at is, is that there's this sort of, you, the, the, the religious practitioner becomes sensitive to this punya production in that way sensitive to this idea that one is constantly producing activity in that sense. And so when I said that this isn't superstition or whatever, the idea is, is that there's sort of a generally understood kind of, it's sort of like, um, it's sort of like a, a metaphysical aspect of society let's call it. And what I mean by that is if you're somebody that's very deceitful, right? And you start to get a reputation for being deceitful, it could happen that you find yourself losing friends. It could so happen that you find yourself losing all kinds of things. And you could find yourself sort of in a precarious situation in life as a result of that behavior of being dishonest. Whereas if you're a very straightforward, honest person, you often find that people like you and support you and are ready to help you out in that way. And so there's a way in which one's lot in life is often improved by being an honest person. And this isn't Again, it's not like superstition or it's not like a bunch of mumbo jumbo. It's just actually looking at the way our behavior ripples and manifests sort of into our reality all the time. And so, you know, we've talked a lot of times in Dharma doors, we've talked about that idea that if one is always sort of bitter and angry and meeting other people with bitterness and anger all the time, odds are you're going to get a lot of anger back. And then that's just going to make you more angry. And then you find yourself sort of just always surrounded by these contentious, angry situations. So my point is, is that, that, that I don't want you to exactly just write off or dismiss this idea of punya. I want us tonight to like look really, really carefully at this. I got a few more things to say about punya in general. So, yeah, let me, a few things to say about punya in general. So, I wanted to share this with you. Um, I would only, I would only recommend this to somebody who's like really, really interested in this topic, but this is a great book. So just want to show you this book really quickly. So this is a book called Practically Religious, um, Worldly Benefits and the Common Religion of Japan. And it's by a professor named George Tanabe. 
I actually studied under George Tanabe at the University of Hawaii. He was one of the advisors on my master's thesis. Um, and this is a really interesting book. And I really like George Tanabe's work because his work is focused on well, what he would call the common religion of Japan. And if you've ever been to Japan, there is definitely a common religion of Japan that is sort of kind of Buddhist, very Shinto, a little Confucian, even kind of a little, little sprinkle of Christianity kind of on the edges. But it's a distinct kind of re common religion of Japan. And what this book is about, as the title suggests, practically religious it's about how in japan the process of making merit like punya like we're talking about this is true of a lot of places it's true of korea true of a lot of parts of china as well but japan it's very very noticeable and what it is is that there's this very well-established system of punya. And what I mean by that is, is that if, for example, if you, well, a classic example, classic example in Japan, if you're a student and you're about to take one of the different series of exams, the, the examination system throughout the Japanese um school system like to move up in the different grades it's intense it's I, I don't know if you know this about japan but it's extremely intense because basically the entire path of your life literally hinges on the series of exams and you know you know if you don't pass this exam you're headed to the factory but if you pass the exam, you could get a salaryman job and basically just, just show up and sit at a desk for eight hours or tw 12 hours a day in Japan, but get a very good salary for it. So my point is, is these exams are very serious. So it's not uncommon for Japanese uh, high school students to go to temples and to do different rituals, to do different services, to do make offerings, it's different. There's all different kinds of temples in that way. But there's a lot of temples that are actually like school exam temples. And that's what they do, is that they are there for the students to come. They, they make offerings, again, of coins, or they do different rituals. And it's basically understood that that ritual will translate to a better score on the exam. And this is, this is just like, it's, it's almost a kind of science is my point. It's not, it, it is religious in that way where, or the outsider would call it religious but there's a certain way, if you, again, if you've ever been to Japan or kind of spent time in Japanese culture, there's a way in which it's not like you're, it's not like you're hoping. It's a, a mechanism that is just at work in the world. And that is what we're definitely talking about tonight is that idea. So the meaning not superstition not just a kind of, well, you know, maybe if I do this, no, no maybes about it. So we, tonight we're looking at or thinking about sort of religious behavior to bring about punya, but not as superstition, as actual, like a, a kind of science in that way. Any questions about punya before I move further ahead? Yeah, no. Um. I want to make sure I understand correctly. I, I wonder if I'm making a false dichotomy between um, acts that are sort of their own reward. Like, for example, going to the gym and lifting weights makes you stronger. Um, you don't need any, there's nothing 
it's the lifting of the weights itself that is the benefit, you know what I'm saying? Versus, uh, let's say the example you just gave, where you go to a temple, you give coins, you get something that will then improve your exam scores, or am I making, is that a false dichotomy? Is, is, is it to them like this is directly improving my exam scores? Is there a dichotomy there? Or, and if so, how does it relate to Punya? Or to how we're talking yep. about? So definitely there's just a direct trend in the Japanese examination thing that I'm describing. There's just a direct translation that if you go to the temple and do the right thing, it's like rubbing a, a rabbit's foot. If you rub the rabbit's foot, it'll do the thing. There's not there's not much more to it than that. What I wanted to, I, thanks for uh, bringing me back to my gym analogy, because what that gym analogy was really meant to set up, and I didn't really finish that idea, so thanks again, Noam. What the gym analogy, what I wanted to get across was that if, if you saw, uh, if you knew that a friend of yours was getting up every day and going to the gym in the morning, and if you said to them, like, oh, like, why are you doing that? And they said, oh, yeah, I don't even know why. No reason. It, and it would be kind of like, well, why? Like, the point is, we don't do things. We tend not to do things unless there's a reason, like a reward yeah. in that way. And that's what I wanted to set up with just that example, that we're sort of always inclined, I don't want to say always, because part of what we're going to talk about is a, another way of thinking that we might not think this way. But the idea is, is that we tend not to do things unless there's a, something, or some reward or a payoff in that way. Even, even going and watching a movie, the reward is the entertainment in that sense. This is all going to make sense a little later. But I just wanted to get across the kind of exchange system in that sense. Can I just ask one more Please. Kind of follow up? In, in education, we talk a lot, and it's not just education, but psychology. We talk a lot about intrinsic rewards versus extrinsic rewards. And maybe that's hmm. kind of what I was getting at. Yeah. And I think what I'm saying is we're talking about rewards. Mm -hmm. whether they be intrinsic or ex extrinsic in that way. Okay. Okay. If that, if that okay. makes sense. Yeah. That's helpful. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. And it will, again, make more sense when we get to another possible way of thinking. Yeah. All right. Everybody doing okay with where we're at? Cool. Okay. So the one thing that I want to mention before we sort of start to segue back into our sutra what I want to mention is the type of punya that we've been talking about, especially when I was talking about like the idea in Japan of going to these very specialized temples. Oh, and by the way, the, there's other kinds of specialized temples in Japan. Some are for the school exams, some are for fertility, some are for wealth. So there's just different kinds of, of, um, uh, reasons why you would do this, like go to a, a, a temple in that way. But what I want to mention about all of that is that that way of thinking about spirituality, that way of thinking about spiritual practice, it's very, very calculable. It's very, very measurable. And what I mean by that is, is that if you, you know, if you, if you go like in Japan, you go to one of these examination temples, there is a very clear, um, like a lot of them, it, they do this ritual where you write out a certain wish and then fold it in these kind of origami. And then you hang it from these trees that are in the temple courtyard. And the idea is, is that it's very one-to-one. -one. I go to the temple, I do the ritual, I write out my wish, I fold the origami, I put on the tree, and it's going to get me the good exam score. So it's very calculable, very measurable. 
And I'm using those terms calculable and measurable very intentionally because we're going to be moving towards the bodhisattva path where they talk about incalculable merit, immeasurable merit, inconceivable merit. And I want that to make sense. And so I'm looking at this other way of, of accumulating punya. And I want to point out how calculable it is. Very, very, very calculable in that sense. And so that kind of brings me around to a point that I want to make before we get into the deeper bodhisattva path. I want to make something really clear. So I don't talk about it a lot because it's just sort of, it's just not my upaya. It's not the way I do things. But we are really talking about morality tonight. Morality is a big part of what we're discussing. And I don't talk a lot about morality. I, you know, I mentioned the precepts. I'll talk about the precepts. But as far as practice goes, I'm usually very more focused on, say, the Dharma in terms of like the more of the philosophy. But tonight, I do want us to really be reflecting on morality for a very particular reason. It's because I don't want any, I don't, there's one idea that I don't want to get lost tonight. So, and the idea that I don't want to get lost is, is like, let's look at, I'm going to just keep using the idea of false speech. I'm going to just going to keep using that of the, of the five big precepts. I'm just going to use the one against false speech. So what we're talking about is sort of this idea of being deceptive versus being honest, all right? And the idea here is, is that from a Buddhist point of view, early Buddhist point of view, Mahayana, doesn't matter. But from a Buddhist point of view, to be deceptive, to lie, is it's problematic and tricky for a number of reasons. There's all kinds of reasons, and I might digress and get into them, but what I want to talk about, though, is, is that there's this general idea that it's just, it's not a good move. It's not a smart move. Even, for, like, it's very short-sighted is ultimately the wisdom about deception and lying. It, 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 might, it might work, like, right now, but in the long run, it just doesn't play out. Whereas honesty is actually good in the immediate and in the long term. And it's just a matter of sort of waking up in a way and realizing that that's true. But my point is, is that there's sort of this idea of wrong and right. Being deceptive versus being honest. And what we're going to be talking about now as we drift into talking about the bodhisattva path is we're going to be talking about a slightly different way of thinking about this. And I don't want to lose sight of the wrong versus right idea. Let me be more clear about what I mean. So the, yeah, the general idea of what, what we're trying to get across here is in the understanding of punya that I've already laid out, it was about uh, punya for my health, punya for my accumulation of wealth, punya for my um, my life's trajectory getting better and better and better, and ultimately punya so that I could get a better rebirth. And I'm emphasizing, of course, that the focus of all of this accumulation of punya, the focus is on me. The idea is, is that I want to be healthier, I want more wealth and prosperity, and I want a better rebirth. So I'll be honest. I'll be a truth speaker. I won't be violent. 
I won't steal. I'll do all those things in order to make sure my health is good, my wealth is good, and my rebirth is good. And the idea here is, again, is that that's very calculable. That's very measurable. And what we're going to be talking about is the bodhisattva path where the bodhisattva is not accumulating punya for themselves. The bodhisattva path, and this is actually a really good way to make the bodhisattva path very clear. The bodhisattva path is where, what makes a bodhisattva a bodhisattva? A bodhisattva is one who has realized, ah, me being honest is better for everybody. It's not just about, it's not just good for my wealth, prosperity, and future rebirth. It's better for everybody if I'm not violent. It's better for everybody if I don't steal their stuff. It's better for everybody if I control my body, and it's better for everybody if I control my mind. So the bodhisattva is interested in a kind of accumulation of punya, but not for their own benefit. And that's where we kind of then circle back around to that talk I gave on the transference of merit. Because what that talk was about was about how a bodhisattva, in looking out for all sentient beings, whoo, a bodhisattva accumulates a great deal of punya for being so magnanimous in that sense. But what makes the bodhisattva even more magnanimous is that there is a follow-up to the accumulation of merit, which is the transference of that merit for the benefit of all sentient beings. And that's a new one. That idea of the transference of merit, as I talked about in that, in that Dharma doors a few weeks ago, the transfer of merit is what makes Mahayana Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, and the Bodhisattva path, the Bodhisattva path. Because in the early form of Buddhism, you couldn't, first of all, you couldn't transfer merit. That's not how it works. According to the early Buddhist tradition, It's that's not at all how it works. And the early Buddhist tradition was effectively just a path for self-liberation. It was not exactly a path for universal salvation. And, the, and because the early Buddhist path was not a path for universal salvation, that's why they call it sometimes the little vehicle, because it's a very elite few of ascetic renunciant monastics, it's that elite few who sort of get the punya and get enlightened in that way. The idea though is, is that as we've talked about, the Mahayana path is very different because of two things. One, again, the Bodhisattva is doing this not for their own benefit. And two, the practice is followed up by this transference of merit, right? So now what I want to talk about is, so this, there's a section that we're going to read. I'll probably get to it in a, in a minute here, but we're going to read a section. We're coming towards the end of our Manjushri Pure Land Sutra, and we're going to read a little section from this, but I want to... Before I read it, I want to remind everybody of something. So many, many times since we've been since we've been studying this sutra, I have made reference to the famous Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra, right? Just known as the Vajra Sutra or the Diamond Sutra. The more I teach Buddhism, the more I realize that it all goes back to the Vajra Sutra, or at least the Mahayana tradition. 
It all goes back to this sutra. And there's a section, it happens early on in the sutra. And it's a section where the Buddha is telling Subhuti, a monk, and they're having a conversation about merit, they're having a conversation about punya. And what the Buddha says to Subhuti is he, and this happens actually like periodically through the sutra, it happens multiple times. But the gist, the general gist of what happens is that the Buddha says to Subhuti something like this. Suppose there was someone who filled an entire universe, a 3,000 great thousand world system. Suppose there was somebody that filled a 3,000 great thousand world system with the seven treasures and then used all of that gold and silver and lapis lazuli and coral and agate and red pearl and crystal, used all of those seven treasures and practiced giving. What do you think, Subhuti? This is what the Buddha says. What do you think, Subhuti? Would that person get a lot of punya? And Subhuti says, Phew. A lot. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's so, it's so generous. It's so much giving, right? And then what the Buddha says is, okay, well, I'll tell you what. If somebody takes just four lines of verse from this Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra and shares it with others, the merit of that person would far surpass the other person's merit. So giving away a universe worth of jewels or four lines from a sutra. And the Vajra Sutra says that giving the four, sharing just four lines of the Vajra Sutra far outweighs the other. And again, this, this happens multiple times throughout the sutra where there is this comparison and the comparison is between giving material wealth and material things away versus giving the wisdom and the knowledge of the sutra away. And what the Buddha ultimately says is that the merit of sharing the four lines of verse from the sutra, that merit is inconceivable. It's immeasurable. It's incalculable. Whereas there's a sense in which you could actually calculate how much punya you would get from each piece of gold, from each bit of silver in that way. So that's the reference that I'm going to kind of kind of keep coming back to, and we're going to kind of hear it echoed in, in our sutra tonight. But I just want to spend an, another moment on that comparison, because there's kind of a lot going on there. So the one thing that I want to mention, I want to mention sort of, we'll, we'll get to the idea of sharing, sharing the wisdom of the sutra. We'll get back to that in a second. But I want to talk about sort of, it's this idea of, like I'm, I'm trying to think of a good kind of example. And I can't fully kind of think of a really good example, but what I, what I want to get at, what I would like to say in a very simple, elegant way is there is a way of say, let me just stick with my one of being honest. So we have this sort of option of either being deceitful or being honest. And as I was saying, 
there's sort of a science, a karmic science to the efficacy of being honest versus being deceitful. And what I want to kind of suggest or or not suggest, but what I want to get at is from a, from, I guess you would say a bodhisattva point of view. And a bodhisattva, of course, is operating from a place of wisdom. The bodhisattva sees how detrimental deception is. Like just sees how detrimental it is to their own being, right? And so their bodhisattva is not going to go anywhere near that. But then there's this idea of being honest. And now there's the situation where I'm sitting there going, you know what? I'll be honest. I don't want to lie to these people. I want them to like me. I want them to trust me. And so you could be honest and be moral in that way from a kind of selfish place. And I don't mean selfish in a, a exactly a bad way, but I mean it as far as where you are. Well, as we would say in English, you're looking out for number one, number one. And so the idea is, is that I'll be moral. I'll be nice. I won't be violent because I don't want people to be violent towards me. I'll be honest because I want people to be honest with me. I want people to think I'm an honest, trustworthy person and so on and so forth. And what I was started to say earlier, and I'm coming back to it, is I don't want to put down being moral, even if it is a self-centered form of morality, because it's way better than being deceitful. But when we're talking about the bodhisattva path, we have to kind of keep in mind, or we should keep in mind, that what kind of makes a bodhisattva a bodhisattva? Well, they're coming deeply from this place or this understanding of emptiness, of there being no self. And so the idea of doing things for my benefit doesn't make a whole lot of sense to a bodhisattva in that way. But a bodhisattva is still going to be very, very honest. But again, why is a bodhisattva honest? It's not for their own benefit. It's because of the wisdom that recognizes, oh, that it's of great benefit to all of us to the whole species, if you will. But as I often like to point out, Buddhists are about all sentient beings, not, not just our species. If it lives, it is sacred in that way. And so Buddhism is interested in modes of behavior that look out for all sentient beings. And so be, not being violent, not stealing, not all of these things contribute to the benefit of all sentient beings. And so what I want to get at is, I want to get at how the bodhisattva practice is sort of, it's off the charts. <laughs> it's immeasurable. It's inconceivable because the impetus, the, the place that it comes from is not about the self because they've realized there is no self. And the deeper part of the bodhisattva practice is this really interesting thing about, oh, there's no self. Oh, not everybody has realized that. We got to get busy in helping everybody realize that there is no self. But again, the point is, is that the bodhisattva would then be a total hypocrite if they were doing the practice or being moral in that way for their own benefit. They would like lose their title of bodhisattva if they were doing it that way, because that's actually the old school Hinayana, where it's just for one's own benefit. So I kind of basically then have set up these kind of three options. 
being sort of like immoral, being moral, and then the bodhisattva path, which of course is moral, it's far from immoral, but it's a different, it's mor you know, morality at a different degree in that sense. And I'm definitely, you know, these Dharma doors and these Sunday night classes are very much about this, why the Bodhisattva path is so special. And this tonight is definitely one reason why it's so special. So, all right, questions, comments, answers, ideas about any of that. Sort of the idea of immeasurable merit, incalculable merit. Yeah. Okay. So now let's take a peek back at our sutra. Hmm. And I think tonight, for simplicity's sake, I am going to read. Yep. Uh, Noam just put the uh, 84,000 link. So that's the Tibetan version translated into English. I'm going to probably read from that one. Just so you know, we are at paragraph number 1.319. So the 319th paragraph of the sutra. Um, and by the way, just for a little context, we have basically finished the sutra proper, like the actual, all the teachings have now been given. Um, sort of just a quick reminder, the very last part was the conclusion of the conversation between Lion Courage Bodhisattva and Manjushri Bodhisattva, where it was established that, you know, in this idea of Manjushri seeking enlightenment or attaining enlightenment, it all boiled down to this idea that even just the, the name Manjushri, right, it is just an arbitrary name. It, it boiled it all the way down to this idea that the reason why Manjushri will not attain enlightenment, doesn't seek enlightenment, is because Manjushri is just a word, an arbitrary term. And that would be like me saying, Michael, yeah, Michael doesn't seek enlightenment. <laughs> Michael is just an arbitrary word term idea that doesn't do anything. So that's sort of where doctrinally and dharmically speaking, this finally kind of came to a kind of grand conclusion in that way. And then after that, it says that when this Dharma teaching was given, the four great kings, Chakra, Lord of the gods, Brahma, the Lord of the uh, Saha world, the enduring world, and other powerful gods, who all are renowned for their great might, proclaimed with a single voice, Blessed one, if anyone who merely hears this Dharma teaching, if anyone just hears this Dharma teaching, they receive an excellent boon, excellent punya. What need we say of those who hear, retain, keep, recite, master, or teach it widely to others? Blessed one, the roots of virtue are not trifling in those who proclaim we will retain, keep, recite, and master this Dharma teaching in order to uphold the qualities of Buddhahood. We will teach it widely to others. All right, let me pause there. I want to talk a little bit about that because I want to return to something I said earlier. So this is now the portion of the sutra, a lot like the Vajra Sutra. This is the portion of the sutra where the sutra starts talking about itself. And that's always an interesting aspect of Mahayana sutras. In fact, one of the really distinguishing characteristics between the early Pali canon, so the Pali suttas, the, all of the early teachings, all of the Pali suttas, 
they do not demonstrate an, an awareness of themselves as being texts. So in other words, the polycanon does appear to be actual records of what someone said. Whereas all of a sudden, when you start to get the Vajra Sutra or sutras like this, this really weird thing happens where the text demonstrates an awareness of itself as a text and then even goes one step further and extols the virtues of, of explaining it. Which is a funny thing to do when you are in the midst of explaining it, right? So my point is, is that I love the Mahayana Sutras for this really interesting kind of recursion that happens where they, they again are aware of themselves. So interesting. But then let's look a little deeper because here it says that if anyone just hears this sutra, right? They're going to receive a lot of punya, right? Forget about how much punya, if you can kind of remember it, you could recite it, you could master it or teach it, right? So that's where I want to return to that uh, example I gave to you uh, from the Vajra Sutra. That example of filling a universe with the seven treasures versus just sharing four lines of verse of this sutra, the Vajra Sutra says. So in general, this kind of idea, it can be very, very easily summarized because there's a very famous, um, I don't know, what, you, what would you call that? I guess it's just a adage suppose it's an adage and there's so there's an old adage that if you give if you give someone a fish they can eat for a day but if you teach somebody how to fish they can eat for the rest of their life it's an old adage and i would suggest that the idea is giving away a universe of the seven treasures is like giving somebody a fish. Whereas giving them just four lines of wisdom from the Vajra Sutra or sharing a sutra like this Manjushri Sutra, that in a way sets them up for life in the way that basically the sutra is saying that the knowledge and the wisdom that's in these sutras is so much more valuable than any amount of gold or silver or what have you. And on the one hand that, you know, you can read that as, as like, again, almost like a Hallmark card where it's like, oh, that's so nice. Yeah. You know, wisdom's, wisdom's better than gold or something. You know, it's like, it, it could be trite, but if you actually kind of think about the Dharma, like the, the deeper Dharma teachings in particular, I'm thinking about like the idea of attachment to stuff. <laughs> what exactly good does it do to give somebody some gold? Either A, they now are get attached to some gold or you given them the means to go buy something they really want. None of that is particularly interesting from a Buddhist point of view regarding attachment to sensual desires and these things. Whereas giving somebody the wisdom of emptiness, that's, it's incomparable. It's, you know, a very, very, very different gift in that way. So everybody doing okay? Questions, comments, answers, ideas? Um, so then let me say a few more words before we move on a few more words about this idea of, um, it's always actually, it's almost 
actually not almost it is a stock phrase a stock phrase of these buddhist sutras is about reading reciting retaining keeping in mind these sutras and i mentioned this i think uh oh i mentioned it last week so last week we i had talked about upaya and the idea of expedient means and then we had talked about the idea of expedient means as way expedient ways of delivering the dharma and then i had suggested that you could look at a sutra as an upaya like meaning a text because it's so expedient it travels through time <laughs> and you could actually write a sutra and then a thousand years later somebody else could discover it in a cave that's pretty expedient that's pretty magical and so the idea is is that this um the sutra calling to the reader to remember it, write it down, recite it, share it with others. It's an interesting, even further type of upaya where they are encouraging you to then spread the teachings in that way. And what I mentioned last week was that this is really interesting because, of course, some of the oldest books and oldest manuscripts in the world are Buddhist sutras. And we probably still have them because there was this injunction to read, recite, copy, and spread them about. And so it worked is sort of one way to look at it in that sense. Um, yeah, and just on a personal note, on a personal note, I know that when I first started reading sutras, the Mahayana sutras, I know that when I first started encountering these sections where the sutra was aware of itself and then was telling the person reading it that they should copy it. I remember when I first read it, I didn't appreciate these sections. I thought they were like, um, they sort of, for me uh, at the time when I was younger, they sort of like ruined the magic a little bit where there was this like really great, you know, teaching going on and then it becomes propaganda. Like, again, this was my earlier mind where I just didn't appreciate them. I appreciate them now because I have this deeper appreciation for the way Mahayana sutras work. Like, it, basically there was a moment a long time ago when I was like, oh, they're not trying to convince you that this is history. Like they're aware that this is an experience that you're having right now. Like they're aware of it. And as soon as I realized that the, that the Mahayana Sutras were operating in that really interesting way, the injunctions to then copy them became even more interesting in that sense. And then of course, now here I am teaching these sutras in that way. So I'm at, I've I've gotten to the point where I'm even really doing what they suggested that one do, share the sutra. Which of course brings me to a point that I I had a note that I wanted to address, right? I get this one all the time. Wow, Michael, you must have so much punya. Every Sunday night, you're teaching all of these sutras, your, 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 your bundle of punya, you know, right? And it's funny because every time somebody says that to me, I, I, have, I pause and I actually think like, oh, yeah, like, I guess this is a good thing I'm doing. My point is, I don't think of this as a good thing I'm doing. I just do it because I enjoy doing it. And it's, that's just what I do in that sense. And so I'm not trying to, you know, pat myself on the back in any way, shape or form. I just mean to say that I, I fulfill the call of the sutra to share it in that way. And I definitely try to kind of approach these things from the bodhisattva point of view, where this isn't sort of for my own liberation or enlightenment or edification in that way so 
just to address that idea of all the punya, right? We we transfer it all. We truly transfer it to all sentient beings every Sunday night. I don't do it enough. I don't do formal transferences of merit in that way. Maybe I should, but it's certainly uh, in my heart I do. So, all right. Any questions or ideas about any of that? Cool. So let's finish reading this section of the sutra because we're still in the midst of the punya section. So then our uh, bodhisattva lion courage, sort of that, that main uh, bodhisattva asking all the questions. So then the bodhisattva lion courage then asked the Buddha, world honored one, how much merit will a noble son or daughter generate by hearing this Dharma teaching? And then if they retain it, keep it, recite it, master it, know it, and teach it widely to others. While all the while having the intention of emulating Manjushri Bodhisattva. So we're all on our one. Exactly how much merit will somebody get if they just hear this sutra? So I, I, you're all ears, right? Because you want to know, like, well, well, what am I getting out of this? Right? How much punya am I going to get tonight? The blessed one, the world honored one answered, noble one. Imagine that a bodhisattva were to fill with jewels all the Buddha lands that can be seen in the 10 directions by a Buddha with an unobscured Buddha eye, and then offered all of this to all to each Buddha in the 10 directions. At the same time, based on an attitude of impartiality towards all beings, that bodhisattva would also abide by all the vows of discipline that they had taken, and more, moreover, would practice generosity until the end of time. Compared to that, if another bodhisattva were to hear this Dharma Sutra, and then retain it, keep it, recite it, master it, know it, and teach it widely to others, or if they were to arouse the intention to emulate Manjushri Bodhisattva and take just seven steps towards that purpose, the amount of merit of this former, of the former Bodhisattva wouldn't even be close to a hundredth of the latter Bodhisattva. It wouldn't even be a thousandth, a ten millionth, a billionth, a ten billionth, or a trillionth, or a quadrillionth of it. In fact, no number, no fraction, no enumeration, no analogy or example would suffice in this regard. So that is very, very reminiscent of the Vajra Sutra example. This is sort of kind of part of the other thing that I want to do with these Dharma doors is really, you know, approach the sutras as literature in that way. And I'm trying to draw out a lot of the tropes a lot of the themes in that way. So this idea of filling worlds with jewels and giving them away versus reciting a sutra, it's a pretty established uh, comparison in that way. And then one note, because I think it's very interesting, also from a kind of um, thematic point of view, you might have caught this idea that so you got one one bodhisattva filling were filling all these worlds with jewels and then making offerings of them, and then this idea of somebody taking just seven steps towards the purpose of emulating Manjushri Bodhisattva. So that language is a very interesting one. I've never actually seen it used this way. You might be familiar with the language of the seven steps because that's a kind of a famous aspect of the life story of the Buddha. In particular, it's an aspect of the birth story of the Buddha. So when the Buddha came jumping out of uh, his mother's side, 
because that's how he was born. He just came springing out the side. He is said to have, from birth, taken seven steps. And each step where he placed his foot, a lotus flower sprouted from the ground. And so he actually didn't even touch the ground, but he took these seven steps. It's a famous part of the story. And you hear it referenced oft, often about the Buddha taking these famous seven steps. But what I haven't heard is it referenced as like a trope in the sense of uh, taking on the practices of Manjushri, for example. And so this language of if somebody takes just seven steps towards the practice of Manjushri. So interesting there. Okay, and let me just finish this one last paragraph regarding the dedication. So at that moment, Manjushri Bodhisattva entered the Bodhisattva Samadhi called Manifestation of the Illusory man Illumination. A Samadhi called Manifestation of the Illusory Illumination. And as soon as he had entered this Samadhi, all the bodhisattvas gathered in the assembly beheld all the blessed Buddhas of the infinite worlds of the ten directions. They saw Manjushri seated in the presence of all of those Buddhas, displaying the array of virtues of his Buddha realm. The bodhisattvas marveled and thought, the Manjushri Bodhisattva is able to display all these quadrillion worlds simultaneously showing how amazing are his unique aspirations, his absorptions, samadhis, and his wisdom. Okay, so I'm going to at least finish this reading tonight. I'm going to finish there. So that last part was an important thing. I'm glad I read to the end. I wanted to remind everybody of something. So. It says that, so it says that at the end of this, Manjushri enters a samadhi, enters a meditative concentration, and then reveals, right? Or yeah, reveals or displays the array of virtues of his Buddha realm for everybody to see. And of course, this sutra is called the array of virtues of Manjushri's Buddha land. And so what I want to kind of talk about is, you know, what would it mean to emulate the practice of Manjushri? And I just kind of, the, the, the way that I wanted to bring this talk to a conclusion was reminding you that this sutra was all about the arrays of virtue of Manjushri's Buddha land. And another way of thinking about that, that language that's pretty, you know, uh, uh, ornate language, right? The array of virtues of Manjushri's Buddha land. But it's sort of about this idea of like punya, merit, virtue in Manjushri's Buddha land. And the idea that we want to kind of be thinking about, we want to be thinking about, it's, it was sort of, I, I don't think I did it the best job tonight. I really, I, I recognize that. But what I was really wanting to set up were these three kind of options. The option of being immoral, the option of being moral, and then this idea of the bodhisattva path. And the basic way of thinking about it from the bodhisattva point of view is again, it's about the detriment of immorality from a place of wisdom. Again, like get out of the idea of like, you know, karmic punishment or ideas of, you know, going to hell or whatever, you know, notions. And just this idea of the, the recognition of the detriment of immorality, and then 
thinking about like, what if, like just imagine if everybody individually in looking out for themselves, what if everybody wasn't violent? Like, so precept number one, nonviolence, ahimsa. What if everybody followed the first precept? Amazing. <laughs> it would, truly, it would be, you know, uh, a very different world if all uh, humans, at least in that way, observed the first precept, precept against violence, right? So what I'm saying is, is that that would be a, a very interesting world to live in, to say the least. But then what would a world be like of bodhisattvas where everybody's being moral? It's a moral world. It's a pure land after all. But their morality isn't coming from that place of looking out for themselves. In other words, not coming from a place of the, the delusion of self. What if everybody's morality was coming from that bodhisattva place of an understanding of the wisdom of no self, and then doing this sort of, um, well, this other practice, which ap is absolutely moral, it's a moral practice, but it's a little different than just being moral in that way. And so again, the idea that you could think about it, or the way that you could think about it, is that the punya of just kind of being moral, it's very calculable, very measurable. Whereas the punya or the merit of a bodhisattva is incalculable and immeasurable. And the idea here is, is to remember or keep in mind that like that they it's actually i'm glad that i did a talk a few nights ago on the idea of the inconceivable because when they say these things about inconceivability or immeasurability it's not just hyperbole it's actually a comment about self-centered ways of thinking that are very one-to-one -one very transactional, very calculable, very measurable in that sense. And so when they say that a bodhisattva receives immeasurable, inconceivable merit, it's actually a very strong statement about that practice in that way. And not just hyperbole about like, oh, it's so cool or whatever. It's like, inconce it's inconceivable. Well, you know, how cool a bodhisattva is. It's actually like, Again, that idea of inconceivability and immeasurability, it has a lot of uh, philosophical importance to it. So, all right. I think I'm going to end it there unless there's any last questions, comments, answers, ideas about punya, bodhisattva path. Well, I guess I had one question uh, regarding, say, when you were discussing honesty. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, sometimes being totally honest is not really the, the nicest thing to do um, with people when you're, I mean, so I, I don't know how, like, how do you even gauge stuff like that? Um, that is a big, uh, there is a big conversation about that. In general, the idea, you know, Renata, what you're sort of getting at is the idea of upaya. And what I mean by that is, is that when we talk about honesty and deception, especially from the bodhisattva path, we do recognize that this does not mean blunt honesty all the time. Because the bodhisattva kind of is very, 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 very interested in compassion. Compassion, all actions of a bodhisattva are led by compassion. And so the idea here is, is an understanding that blunt honesty might not be the most compassionate. The bodhisattva might then not share that bluntly honest opinion. And there are even upayak situations where 
what we would call deception or lying is reasonable or valid for the same reasons because we are interested in compassion but i we need to be very clear about this though the bodhisattva is is coming from a place of compassion utmost and foremost and so the idea is is that if that is true that that's where it's coming from then that sort of outweighs what would be called deception because it's not really deception and what I mean by that is, is, you know, deception is a very like, I'm going to try to get one over on you, right? I'm going to try to trick you. But if I actually um, have utter compassion for you in mind, and that's where I'm coming from, it's a different thing then at that point. And this is actually where, you know, the Bodhisattva path is a little tricky like that because of the Upaya thing where the bodhisattva has to be honest with themselves about their motivations in these things. And only the bodhisattva knows in, the, in that sense. So. Yeah, Renata. Thank you. Yep. All right, everybody. Then I'm going to... That'll be it for tonight. We still have a couple more paragraphs to go on the sutra. Uh, another kind of um, section. It's another section of Mahayana sutras, which is the naming of the sutra. What is this sutra called? And so we're going to dig into a bunch of alternate titles for the sutra and talk about what that's all about. So stay tuned for that next uh, next week.